Happy 15th birthday to True Marketing. Hey, everybody. On today's episode, we are going to be taking a look back at the past 15 years of how marketing has changed, how the industry has changed, how our company, True Marketing, has changed, and share some fun personal stories. To do this with me, I'm inviting on my co-founder of True Marketing, Rebecca Geyer, along with the two longest standing True Crewers that are still with us today, which is Lee Chapman and Morgan Norris. Let's do this. Welcome to Content Marketing Engineered, your source for building trust and generating demand with technical content. Here is your host, Wendy Covey. Hi, and welcome to Content Marketing Engineered. On each episode, I'll break down an industry trend, challenge, or best practice in reaching technical audiences. You'll meet colleagues, friends, and clients of mine who will stop by to share their stories. And I hope that you leave each episode feeling inspired and ready to take action. Before we jump in, I'd like to give a brief shout out to my agency, True Marketing. True is a full service agency located in beautiful Austin, Texas, serving highly technical companies. For more information, visit truemarketing.com. And now on with our podcast. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Content Marketing Engineered. I am so excited about today's episode. It's a never before thing here with our 15th anniversary of True Marketing. Woo! One hey. five. <laughs> So I have brought along three very special guests to help celebrate this, and I'm going to have each of them introduce themselves. So Rebecca, we'll start with you. Okay. Uh, it's exciting to be on the show for the first time. Uh, my name's Rebecca. I um, am wearing different hats right now, CMO of an AI SaaS startup headquartered in London, um, working still with engineers. Um, I also teach a class at the engineering school here in Austin at UT in the engineering management program. And in my spare time, I've been working on a first ever textbook on content marketing. So that's what I've been up to. Awesome. Okay. And your always title as well is? A co-founder of True Marketing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, Lee, how about you? Hi, yes. So Lee Chapman, so president of True Marketing, and I don't know what employee number I was, maybe like four, five, four. somewhere yeah. in there. Four. 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 Yeah. yeah, so it's been a little over a decade of awesomeness with all of the the true team. And so many of us work together, the four of us here, especially at National Instruments. So Rebecca, I think I you hired me in 2001 when we were all back at National Instruments. So I know we'll talk more about that. I won't, I won't, Wendy, steal all the, the questions before we get going, but that's a little bit about me. And awesome. Morgan. And I'm Morgan Norris and I have been with True for almost, working with True for almost 13 years. And I am our senior brand and content strategist. And so just love what I do and obviously love true marketing because um, I am here <laughs> and have <laughs> stayed and just really enjoyed it. So, And once upon a time, you as well worked with Rebecca and Lee and I did bit myself at NI. I oh. did. Yeah. Well, those of you that are watching rather than just listening may notice that Rebecca and I are matching today. We didn't even plan it, wearing our OG True Marketing shirts, the very first shirt we ever made. And uh, Rebecca was commenting on, uh, wh where do these shirts come from? So I think I surprised you with these for our first anniversary. You did. And it was in Wendy Brown. <laughs> which will be explaining absolutely what wendy brown means the <laughs> first and last brown shirt exactly <laughs> <laughs> maybe that should be my alias wendy brown anyway wendy brown. uh well well let's start with a with a warm-up question here and uh so true marketing was founded by rebecca and myself in 2008 so I want to go back one year before that. So let's think way, way back to 2007, just prior to True Marketing becoming a business. 
what were you up to? Like, what was your job? What was your life like? Just, just kind of give me a state of affairs in your life at that time. Rebecca? You want me to go first? Yeah. Actually, Morgan's probably is more interesting than mine because. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, and this will jog your memory because, okay, 2007, I was one year out of college and I had just gotten married and I had interned at NI mm -hmm. and then gotten hired there. And I started on the PR team. Um, and I was just recounting this to Jen. She was saying some like outlandish things. She would never have somebody do in an interview. And then I said, do you remember what you had me do in an interview? <laughs> they had me, Jen and Julia had me pick up a phone and pretend call and like pitch something that they just handed me to an editor and I was I walked out of that room wow. and I was like I didn't get that job um, <laughs> but, I, but I did Dude. uh and 2007 I think I was kind of finding my footing I shared a cue ball with Rebecca mm -hmm. um at and I and but I was a little bit finding my footing in that I started in PR I loved the writing and content development aspect of it. I did not love the pitching side of it. And so we were looking at kind of how to move me over to um, Jennifer Dawkins team in content development and case study development. So I lived in Austin. We had just bought a house. Like I could like see NI from my house. Um, I could go walk home or, or drive home and feed my dog during lunch. And so it was just, my world felt like nice and clean and small and very cute. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that. I actually am jumping ahead a little bit, but I remember when I called you after we had first started True. I'm like, hey, Morgan, you're on, <laughs> you're on maternity yeah. leave. How's that going? And I yeah. think I said and I by then, but anyway, I'm jumping ahead. Um, <laughs> in 2008, Wendy and I had both had our, well, you had your first child. I had my second and they were three years old. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's right. Yeah. 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 Eight years old. When I'm, I'm thinking 2005, they were born in 2000. So they were getting oh, those kids. I thought you meant that other kid of mine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. So we had, we were pregnant together with our second, with, with your first and my second, our boys. And um, they were getting to be handfuls. Is that fair? Yeah, so oh. <laughs> <careful. laughs> anyway, he may edit that um, part out, but we'll see. No, but it just, you know, being a mom and being a mom of two kids and um, the corporate, you know, kind of pace was a lot. Um, and I was traveling a lot overseas, very extended trips. And so I think we were both, well, I don't want to speak for you, but I know for me, kind of ready. I had been at NI um, 14 years and I could have stayed there 14 more is the most incredible career that anyone could ask for. I learned so much, um, but was kind of feeling unchallenged and kind of ready to do something different. And I think you were kind of ready for a change for different reasons. And um, yeah, so anyway, I'll let you take it from there. <laughs> well, uh, I'll, I'll tell mine and then I want to hear yours too, Lee. So I was a newlywed. Uh, so in 2007 was when uh, my husband, I, Randy, were married. So in addition uh, to having those rambunctious kids, uh, you know, um, had had newlyweds that wanted to start a family a pretty good distance from NI. So the idea of working uh, remotely at least a few days a week was really appealing and that wasn't an option. So that was definitely uh, one factor that, that led me to want to seek, you know, door number three is, is I like to call it in uh, career, career terms. Um, the other thing I think was so interesting as I look back on those final years in NI is I was in the middle of this transformation of, of turning their software products, including LabVIEW, into a SaaS model. And, and SaaS wasn't really the word we called it then, but that's exactly what it was. And so I, mean, I just find that all interesting of, oh, I, that was SaaS. I led a whole SaaS revolution at the company without knowing that <laughs> that's what I did until now, because we didn't have the nomenclature. We were a little ahead of our, our time there. So that was that was pretty cool. Lee, what were you up to? In 2007, I was about halfway, I didn't know it at the time, but I was halfway through my 
11 year career at NI. And I had um, moved from the corporate communications team and managing our corporate content team of writers um, and community relations team to the corporate design group and managing a group of web designers and developers and project managers. And it was super fun. It was, the beginning of that was fun. The corporate design group had all the budget. They had fun parties. They were like the, they were like the cool kids. And I was such a dork and I was trying to be like cool and hip and like wear cool colors and stuff. Cause I was on the creative team, but anyway, it was a great, you know, next step. And I learned so much on that team. Um, and it was a lot of fun. And I remember Rebecca coming over and she's like, okay, like we're, when and I are leaving, we're going to like create this company. It's cool. Like maybe you'll come someday. And I was like, that sounds really risky. And I'm like, risk <laughs> you guys are super smart. I'm sure it's going to be great. <laughs> anyway and if it works out in like five years when that's like safe then maybe you know maybe I'll call you up and then I did and then, it did. Call, I and then you. one day that phone call came <laughs> uh, right. so let's talk about our crazy name because we hear from a lot of people with the last name true and uh all these misconceptions um a lazy keyboard trick uh it, which if, if you go look at the keyboard true is like backwards like all together on a, a cordy is that how you say that's it? right QWERTY mm -hmm. keyboard, or maybe it has something to do with our husband's initials and our initials. I don't know. So uh, Rebecca, why don't you clear that up? Where did the name come from? Yeah. So this is a fun one. Um, so we did, we had a long list of names. Um, they were all taken like Google. Oh, that's a great name. And then Google. Get the dot com. <laughs> Dang it. Ooh. Dang it. It's, it's gone. It's taken. So um, I've always, I had always been a runner and I had a running injury. So I started doing kayaking or crew on Lake Austin. And I was out there in this very docile, wonderful, peaceful experience out on Lake Austin one morning. And I was thinking back about this internal training, I communications training I had created and was teaching at and I called, it was just leadership communication, but I gave it kind of a tagline of trust drives results. Um, and so I was thinking about that. And the word trust, uh, as I was thinking about that training, the word true came to mind. And it was like, wait, that's it, true, with a twist on the word. So the EW instead of the UE um, gave us not only the original word, but it also helped us incorporate four very important initials. <laughs> um, my husband, Tim, gets the T, you get to the W, and Randy and I, your husband has to share the R. <laughs> so oh, yeah. anyway, um, yeah. And and then maybe I'll let you explain the turned up E. Yeah. So we, uh, Rebecca and I don't have a design background and we were, you know, a, a company of two. So we turned to a local design firm in Austin and they sat down with us and asked lots of questions about the name and our business. And we're telling them and we're, you know, these excited young entrepreneurs. And um, by the end of it, they said, wow, you guys have so much energy and enthusiasm. And so that's where we ended up having this upturn E it's to represent that you know, that vibe that they got from us. And, you know, it, it didn't occur to us until much later of, oh, like Dell also has an upturn E and they're here in Austin. So maybe there's some weird subconscious thing there, but uh, it's lowercase. So it's totally different. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, okay. So these shirts are brown, which is sort of an odd color for a corporate color. And it's certainly not a color you see on True's website today. Um, how do you pick company colors? Uh, Rebecca, you had a very formal process for this. Well, what I rem yeah, what I remember was I did not have a great idea about colors. And you said, Hey, we should both, this is like, so windy. This is so like <laughs> awesome. Rebecca, go home to your closet and pick out the, the two shirts that you are like the few shirts that you love the most. And then we'll just all do the same. And then we'll just like, how genius is that? That you're going to be in your brand colors for the rest of your life. You probably ought to pick a color that you like. And that's super like, smart. So smart. So I was like, that's genius. So I went home and lo and behold, turns out one of my favorite colors is coral. 
not orange. Um, but this, so anyway, I brought coral. I think you brought brown. Um, and you had a special aversion to anything orange, <laughs> being an Aggie. So you, <laughs> you found yourself constantly, you know, correcting people that are longhorns in particular. That is not orange. That is coral. That is not longhorn orange. It's not burnt orange. I could show you the PMS colors. <laughs> And I remember thinking, well, I, I really like brown, but I don't know about it being a corporate color, but it is a color I wear a lot. And <laughs> anyway, yeah, over time we said, yeah, it really isn't a good corporate color, but it, hey, it made these shirts. So that's It good. made these shirts. <laughs> yeah. um, well, True Marketing has been a virtual business since the very beginning. We've never had a physical office. So what drove the decision to be a virtual company? Yeah, we tried to find an office a couple of <laughs> we, <laughs> we, went some, try. we went on some office tours, but um, I feel like you were really visionary about this, Wendy, mm -hmm. kind of from day one, more than me. <laughs> I think you really like the idea of having the big sign out front, the big billboard, but um, yeah, it helped that we were, we live on opposite sides of the Austin Metroplex and the in-between is the most expensive real estate pretty much other than downtown. So some of it was practical, but, but very early on, we realized that it, it was, um, a differentiator. It helped us recruit people. It was something that people valued. And so I'm curious, Leanne Morgan, did did us being virtual factor into your your decision to join True? And what do you think about working virtual all these years later? Because you guys, I mean, over a decade working virtually, right? Yeah, I can go first. Um, it for sure played in a big part for me when I when Rebecca called me when I was on maternity leave. I was kind of um, oscillating between kind of what are my options and what's out here. I knew I wanted to spend a little bit of time at home for at least a couple of years while I had little kids and um, I didn't want to forego work. And so I was also looking at contract jobs and other things that I could do. Um, but the opportunity to be virtual, it has it looked, it has given me different opportunities over time even, I think. Um, for me, initially, it was that flexibility of taking out the the big commute or taking out um, things like that that just put those barriers between you and an office. And then, I mean, as recently as the last few years, we moved to Washington, D.C. And I live in downtown D.C. We're here for a few years for my husband's job. And it was like, no big deal. Um, I just, just the ease of doing that and the lack of disruption to my work has been really incredible, I think, at, especially through this time that I have like a young family and stuff. And I even think about we're about to, we'll move back to Austin soon. And, um, you know, I don't, for me, I don't, I, where do we want to be? Do we want to be in this neighborhood or that neighborhood? And there's some flexibility there, right? Because you, there's not only is it expensive real estate between Wendy and Rebecca, it's like insanely congested traffic too. Mm -hmm. um, no one wants to cross the river for work really. So anyway, it's just huge opportunities, I think. Um, and then of course we had COVID where everybody had to work from home and um, then everybody's home in your own workspace. And I think that was probably one of the most disruptive things. You're like, I know how my home office runs and now there's all these other people around here all day. <laughs> You're not um, supposed to be here, only me. <laughs> but man, when that, when that hit, it like wasn't a blip for us at all. Other mm -hmm. than that, other than having more human footsteps around my house, this is something we know how to do. We do it really well. Um, it's no big deal for us to pick up the phone or hop on a video call. And so many people had such an adjustment there. And I felt like we could just hit the ground running because there was no adjustment. Yeah. yeah, I, I felt a little different. I really, in the beginning, I remember kind of feeling like, gosh, but I like going into an office. I don't know if I really want to be remote. My house isn't really set up for me to work from home. Like this is a, this is a whole new thing. And, and, I remember my neighbors saying, oh, great, you're working from home. You can pick up my kids from gymnastics at 3 p.m. And you're, there was this whole perception that working from home or working virtually was you weren't really working. You were just kind of collecting paycheck. And I was like, 
no, no, like I'm working like 50 hour weeks. I'm on all these calls. We've got clients all over the country. So um, it, it was a bit of an adjustment being at home, but it was ideal timing because um, my kids were middle school and high school. And so being able to like adjust my schedule so I could start my day really early and be finished before they came home, I could drive them to school every day. I could pick them up from school. Um, really in that, that middle and high school time, you know, it was great to be able to be, be there and work and kind of have this combined, you know, work-life balance. Um, I also didn't miss sitting an eight hours straight of meetings every day and then coming home every night and then responding to email and doing all the other work that had to be done. It was really nice to feel like you had focus time. Um, you, you didn't have the commute. You weren't walking back and forth to different buildings. So it, that was better quality of life for sure. And just more things that could get done both, you know, whether you could throw in a load of laundry during your lunch hour or do a walk around the block with your dog. I mean, all of these things, just like I said, it totally changed my life uh, for the better. Yeah, I will say some of the efficiencies that we have, we work so much faster, I think, than I remember working in the corporate environment because you're just, you're pulled into so many meetings where there's like 15 people around the table and you don't ever say anything in that meeting or I didn't being a new hire, you know. Um, and so some of those just efficiencies gained in how quickly we can work and deliver for clients. Um, it like feels good to be that productive and to be able to turn things around and really get quality work done so quickly. So when I think about, you know, the technology that's impacted the craft of marketing specifically, um, you know, I, I've, I've had the opportunity uh, to be kind of before internet marketing and after internet marketing to date myself. <laughs> I um, love even the turn in, in internet marketing. <laughs> I know. Like awesome. I should say marketing before the internet and marketing <laughs> after the internet. Like there's a line yeah. in the sand where there was not the internet and then now there is. And of course, you know, it's, you can't even remember um, back then, but um, you know, the, the, the whole um, shift toward inbound and content marketing for me, it, we take it for granted, you know, today, it's just how you do it. But um, that was a massive shift in both the customer and how they went about their buying process and the marketer and how you had to completely shift how you engaged and and kind of got found, if, you know, using the HubSpot terminology. So yeah. For me, you know, and, and and you hear so much about technology today, generative AI and all these tools. And, um, and of course, it's huge and we all need to be paying attention to it and figuring out, uh, you know, how we're going to incorporate it. You guys have a, a blog post out right now about it. And you guys are studying it. All the big HubSpot partners are really helping us. Of course, Paul and Kathy and their team at Marketing AI, AI Institute are really thought leaders in this area. So we look to them. I have part of my team doing their writing course uh, later next month awesome. um, that, that they're doing. So, um, so we've got to stay up on this. But at the end of the day, to me, um, and it, we're early in this, I mean, literally like months from, a, from a having tools in our toolbox as marketers to use generative AI. Um, but, but to me, the fundamentals of how you do marketing and in particular understanding the customer and their challenge and passionately creating content and, and engaging information that's valued that you build their trust, like that's not gonna change with generative AI. And yeah. in fact, I think we even have an opportunity as marketers to even differentiate ourselves further by understanding the customer so intimately well that we can, as an agency, provide much more value than, um, than than kind of agencies who don't take that as seriously, especially you know with True and our focus on the the engineer. I mean, the decisions that they're making are like they're, they're literally career limiting decisions. There are huge risks, safety, not just careers, safety, the risk to brand. I mean, it just goes on and on. The the that's why they're so skeptical. And that as they should be. And that's why they're so research oriented in their decisions. So 
it's just even more emphasis, in my opinion, on the marketer and the value of content in particular in building those audiences and in, in engaging them. So, so yeah, to me, inbound and content was um, this move to work content marketing. We've done it for years. You've done content marketing. I mean, since the beginning of time, they've been writing on walls, right? In hieroglyphics, it's content marketing. You're using art and words to communicate your message. So it's no different, but it's that internet change that how the customer became in control of their process of their, their buying process and how that changed the, how we do marketing that, that really was fundamental uh, to me. And it, and it, it makes it a lot more fun. I think. Tool development um, has been crazy. And I think uh, to Rebecca's point, like yeah. we're trying to figure out, yes, how do we use these tools as, as tools in our toolbox, but to really truly know and understand your customer and be able to create something that speaks directly to them. It's something that as a brand we've done so well as a company um, really? year after year after year. And it looks for us, that looks like having really uh, talented writers who can explain really, really technical concepts clearly and well, and in a compelling way. Um, and it looks like creating brands that kind of stand out and stand above. And I think that that's something we've always done. We've always held this technical content and messaging to such a high, high level and yes, we've got AI tools kind of in our back pockets, but um, it's really the kind of creative work that we've done. And I love that generative AI is like such a hot topic, but then we think about uh, just all the AI things that came before, right? It feels new and I think scary to people, but then you're like, you've had auto captions on your videos for a long yeah. time and those were AI generated. I've had Grammarly um, plugins for three or yeah, four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Word has been uh, suggesting changes to what you're writing um, very consistently. And so it's it's new tools, um, but it's it's the same core concept of knowing your customer and communicating well to them. Yeah. Agreed. Remember the days we used to talk about integrated marketing and try to teach on, <laughs> 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 but even that is still this concept that continues to be core yeah. to doing marketing is having understanding that customer and having that central message. And then how is everything tied together? So we may describe it in different ways, you know, the du jour terms, but it's still those same fundamentals, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Wentz HubSpot can have integrated marketing campaign dashboards. <laughs> We're still fighting for that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, any any other as as we think about the past 15 years, anything else stand out to you I guys? Lee mentioned um like Canva, but I think the kind of commoditization of design, you think about the mm -hmm. first websites that we did is true. And they were all, they were these custom sites and they were so labor intensive and so difficult to to fix later and update and change later. And the tools, as far as web design goes, not only do we have so much more insight, but to to throw up pages and to put up content that's looks good and is branded well and loads quickly just the the path to that has gotten so much shorter um and, and same thing with design like Lee said I mean the path to a nicely designed infographic is it's like it's just so much closer than it used to be <laughs> I think um analytics is something that just boggles the mind like so many different tools so many sources of data that you can comb through. And of course, there's a big move over to um, Google Analytics 4 that's just coming out. We're trying to wrap our head around that. They've changed um, definitions of things that we've known for decades and now we're relearning it. It's not like an update. We keep saying it's an entirely new tool. Um, of course, HubSpot's got their analytics. There's a ton of analytics tools out there that people are using. And so I think that's the other challenge that, of, um, marketer space is what is my source of truth? Where do I, what tools do I use to go find the right data and what type of informed decisions can I now make from this data? Turning back to uh, true marketing as a business in our, in our final uh, minutes that we have left, there were some 
pivotal business decisions that we made that really had an impact on our success. And one of these I want to pick on first because I will never forget we weren't making very much money as a business. And Rebecca comes to me and says, I think we should write a book. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> what? You want to do what? Can we, can we, should we just like get some more customers first? So <laughs> Rebecca, too. what, what the heck was going through your head? <laughs> I don't, I don't even know why it struck me in that moment, but I, I just, you know, cause engineers are skeptical of marketing and we had, we have such a good methodology and we take it, we take our craft and we take their decisions and the challenges that they're facing really, really seriously. And so I just felt like if we had a book that they could read and it was like with data, then they would they would have their own space to kind of get comfortable with the idea. And it would um, be a way for us to just document that proven methodology that we know is effective and that we 100% believe in. And uh, it's not a matter of us believing in it, it's a matter of convincing them to believe in it. And so I just thought that would be a way yeah, to do that. But um, but but good advice. Let's get some customers first. <laughs> hey, <laughs> held it's off the, on that. A, held off on that a few years. <laughs> what is it? The genius of the and. <laughs> we managed to pull it pull it all off. Um, Morgan Lee, what are some other things that you guys can think of that stand out to you? The smart business decisions. The research, the whole educational platform, right? It started with one book and then it was two books and then it was a podcast. And then Morgan's leading this great writing training where she's educating new writers and strengthening their technical writing abilities. Um, it's just, I think that is really a differentiator. You don't see a lot of agencies really going all in. And to Rebecca's point for a really, you know, for a discerning engineering audience, like all of, they really want to be educated. They don't want to be sold to, and they do want to create, look at content kind of in their own space, in their own time. And so I feel like, and now we've got multiple form factors for which they can consume it in. So I think that that really stands out to me as something that, that was pretty instrumental. Yeah. in the research too, right? Having mm -hmm. annual research, there's a, so much research out there about what marketers want, what marketers need who are marketing to, to technical audiences, but not the research around what, what do these technical audiences actually want? When do they want to talk to you? What types of content do they want to see before they talk to you? Just those, how long is their buying cycle? Like, let's understand that. I think doing that, just it, it guides our recommendations that we make to clients. And then I think it's honestly just such a great like service that we do to the industry as a whole mm -hmm. um, to just educate. It's a win for us if there's better marketing across the board, even if we don't do all of it, we don't want to do all of it. Um, but, but having committing to that has been such a great stake in the ground for us, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I can tell you how many people I've come across in the U S and Europe in particular, who know the research, like they don't even know me or true or, but they're like, oh yeah, well, there's this research out there. I'm like, really, is there? <laughs> tell me. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's globally known and, and trusted and respected. Sure. Wonderful. Thanks. I think too, I'll never forget Rebecca, because you're you've always been a fan and we're all sort of surrounded by these books, but of, of book groups, right? And you're like, we're gonna read this new book and it's gonna revolutionize how we lead our meetings and run our business. It's called Traction. Oh, and we're geez. gonna put in EOS and it's L10 yep. and it's all these acronyms. But yeah. I I mean I think that was really a turning point for the business too when we implemented that and we were already what I would say unconsciously competent and it just made us consciously competent and it gave us this model and this template. Um, and so I really think, you know, when you brought that in and um, that was all of us, I think read that and we're like, Ooh, this is going to be, like you said earlier, game changer mm -hmm. and uh, really created efficiencies and given us tools and, and a way to make decisions that I think have really strengthened the business. So when you think about working with clients, what are some of the cool like areas of technology that you had the opportunity to learn? Hmm. I can go. 
I got a big dose oh a God. few years ago of actually it was like four years ago because it was before I moved. So super early um, in the technology, but around blockchain, we were working with a startup that had a really cool kind of middleware technology um, and and got to kind of walk with them as they explained that to people and explained it to investors. And it was a really challenging time because crypto was like everybody attached blockchain with crypto and crypto was tanking. And um, but it was just a, a gave me such a great base layer for things to come in the years that followed. That's a cool one. Did it make mm-hmm. you run and want to invest in crypto or the opposite or neutral? <laughs> nope. Nope. So the cool thing is, is that's part of it is it's not it's just all just tied to crypto. It's right? just tokens. Yeah. And so yeah. it's like, it's the way that how does, how does everybody who touched a song that got written get paid appropriately? What's well, blockchain? It's tokens tagged to yeah. all the aspects of song writing, producing, developing, and people have different shares of tokens and that's how they get paid out. And um, verification so, that something yes, is yep. legitimate. I heard mm-hmm. that on fine wines that now there's a blockchain oh, to interesting. say this hundred thousand dollar bottle of wine that I'll never buy. Uh, and then you can, it really is worth it. <laughs> it's providence. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> Who knew? Yeah. I think for me, it's just more of the variety. Like it's just mind blowing what engineers and scientists are up to and what they're creating. I mean, just what you're just talking about, Morgan, you know, you just, and and it's so many things that the kind of average human, like the four of us that are not engineers and scientists, you don't even understand the complexity of what has gone in to just create an electric vehicle, you know, Mm -hmm. or a smart meter that's on the side of my house now that digitally reads my gas and gives me, you know, a, a bill that's within regulatory, you know, percent of, of accuracy that engineers, you know, had to create that smart meter with the physics of the, of the gas going through and measuring that, you know, accurately. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't know, it's, to me, it's just one of the customers that was, um, was just remarkable to me was, um, this customer, uh, Silicon, Silicon audio, Silicon, Mm -hmm. Silicon audio. Silicon audio. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and in fact, I was just talking to, um, uh, Neil the other day, um, and that they, you know, he had this invention of the, you know, kind of revolutionizing the geophone market. And I was like, what's a geophone yeah, no kidding. <laughs> and then you know fast forward three months and yeah. we're like doing branding on optical yeah. seismometers and learning about the old way of how you find energy deposits and it's pretty crazy how they used to do it and how they still do it and how much more accurate and more cost efficient and um yeah optical seismometers are so th- yeah that and then you know one of one of our favorite uh, well, I should say one of my favorite customers was ATL up in Salt Lake City and mm-hmm. work that they were doing around medical um device connectors and getting mm-hmm. all of the data you know out of the tip the kind of camera on a tip of doing you know surgical um procedures and the data that you can get out of just through the connector I mean, it's mind blowing yeah. um it just goes on and on so yeah. I'm fortunate to be working with um, AI engineers and data scientists, they're PhDs in data science out of, um, out of, uh, Imperial and, and other really amazing places in, in England. And yeah, it's just an honor always, always has been for me. Always. Um, engineers. Yeah. yeah. I had that, I had the optical seismometer down to, um, Rebecca, I was like, <laughs> for me, that was it. It's like the the motors that are, it's a yeah. motor. Motors have been around for under 100 years almost now at this point, but now they're small enough to go in fans. And, um, yeah. you know, it just it's crazy the size, the weight, it's all changing. The electric vehicle market, electrification mm-hmm. of everything is a uh, concept. Um, and the seismometer, right? Taking a, a, a tool that had been out there for years and then making it this optical seismometer. So it's just the genius, like you said, of engineering and just the solving of the grand challenges of engineering, right? And exactly helping sustain our planet. And it's just so satisfying, the hardware, the software, um, 
the ideation. And then so many of the clients we work with are, you know, in the national security realm or they're, you know, designing components for new space. Um, and so there's so many things that they're doing that we can't even talk about because it's so talk. <laughs> <concerned. laughs> <It's true. laughs> oh, I'm in the hey. I never know. <laughs> there are engineers doing innovative things everywhere in the world and that's not going away. And yeah. their need to um, build trust with target audiences is a key ingredient for their success. So I think you guys have a very bright future globally. Thank you. I'll take a little bit of a different slice. I'll say that there seems to be a lot of consolidation and mergers and acquisitions of companies that we work with. And so I think we're going to continue seeing that where we started out working with, you know, these smaller, you know, five to $10 million in I Alliance partners, now we're really seeing that we're working with a lot more um, global billion dollar customers. Um, and I think that's just gonna continue as this consolidation kind of throughout the technology space continues. Yeah, it's been really And that also leads into Europe, so. Yeah, like there you go. Europe, yeah. It's been interesting to have clients who are acquiring other companies and, and growing very rapidly and us being a, a part of that journey, not only for yeah. branding, but just helping with demand and culture and all, all sorts of different facets of that. So uh, thank you all so much for being here. Um, everyone who's listening and watching, you can connect with each of our folks today on LinkedIn and of course the True Marketing website. And Rebecca, we're so happy to see your beautiful face here with I'm us. Happy. And uh, don't be a stranger. Come back anytime. Next, next time we'll bring cocktails and, and tell more stories. Yeah. <laughs> we'll wear maybe after hours. Cool. After hours, uh, <laughs> wear some coral. I like that. I did find out that coral is in my color palette. So all these years I was fighting against the coral, and now I'm, I'm all about it. So we could be bringing that polo back. We'll send you one, Rebecca. Grayson, I'll take it. That'd be great. There you go. All right, bye everybody. Thanks for joining me today on Content Marketing Engineered. For show notes, including links to resources, visit TrueMarketing.com/podcast. While there, you can subscribe to our blog and RA newsletter and order a copy of my book, Content Marketing Engineer. Also, I would love your reviews on this podcast. So please, when you get a chance, subscribe and leave me your review on your favorite podcast subscription platform. Thanks and have a great day.